It's our story. Eleanor Smith, Atlanta, Georgia. A year later, Habitat for Humanity stepped up and said, let's try every new house with access. And I believe those were the first houses in the country that were deliberately built with access for people who did not have a disability. They had zero step entrances and wide doors. And it was so thrilling. You know, when the first 10, 20 houses went up, I would just, if I was going somewhere, I would go out of my way to go down that street and just feel these are real houses. They have front doors, they have windows, and they embody the spirit of, of welcoming and of being able to come home from the hospital and of being part, being part of the scene, being part of the community. Um, since then, other cities have taken it up. I would say, probably conservatively, maybe a total of 12,000 houses across the United States in 20 different locations um, where the builder has built a house that's basically accessible for a non-disabled buyer. Um, and not, not a special house even that, where you hire your own architect, but speculative housing, housing where you don't know the owner before you build it. Um, it's growing. It has to grow. Sometimes I get discouraged at how long it's taking because I know how easy it is to do and I know how harsh the consequences are of not doing it. So it just sometimes is really hard to take that, that you still go out to the edge of town and all the same barriers are being built in the, most of the houses. I'll say one more thing there. Besides Habitat deciding to do that voluntarily, another victory is that there have sprung up little laws where certain houses have to have basic access, whether or not the uh, buyer has a disability. The most radical of those places, one being a city in Illinois, that has a law that every new house will have access. And also a, a large section of Pima County, Arizona, every new house has access. They say they have about 6,000 houses up. So my hope is these people will receive visitors from all over the country and it will spread because they will go in that house and they will say, gee, I better take this back to my town. It's taking a while. But I mean, I think it's great that some houses have some towns have exceeded Atlanta considerably and have a, a law that every new house will have access. And they've succeeded. They've been able to do it. I think when people first, people with disabilities, first experience their disability, it may not occur to them that things could be different. I know that I accepted lack of access, even though it was damaging my quality of life, it didn't occur to me that it could be otherwise. I just thought of it as the weather, so to speak. Oh, it's raining. It's not raining. This house is accessible. This one isn't. I didn't really put it in my mind that houses are built according to decisions that, are pe that people make. But whether or not the person is conscious of the fact that things could be different, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of exclusion person can't go visit their own sibling. I know a lot of people who can't get in their siblings' houses, their grown siblings. Um, not only can, can you not always accept an invitation to a party, but a lot of times I think the invitations don't get issued because someone is thinking, well, they probably couldn't get in my house. It would be a hassle. I'm, I'm not even going to you know, invite them because I don't want to embarrass them. So I think even for little kids, I just really want life to be different to, for little kids so that they can go to the birthday party. Or if it's a disabled parent, their parent can come in, pick them up at the birthday party and talk to the other moms and dads. It's very isolating to not be able to go in people's houses. That's where most social life takes place. Even, that's even where most jobs are found. There was research done by the Wall Street Journal that said most jobs are found by word of mouth. Well, if you can't go in anyone's house where people are sitting around the kitchen table saying, hey, 
there's an opening at my office. Um, it even affects your ability to get a job. So much of life occurs in the houses of our relatives, our friends, our neighbors. Um, and it's a shame that something so simple as making that, making integration more possible is taking a long time to, to uh, take place. You know, I remember um, being 13 and I had a couple of really good friends and I was fairly popular at school. But here I was, 13, on the corner, talking just before school started, and one of my friends mentioned um, a party that had actually been held by my best friend over the weekend. And my friend just looked stricken. And I looked at her. You had a party and you didn't invite me? And she just looked like she felt really bad. And she said, well, my mom thought that you wouldn't be able to get in our house. And so my mom thought it would be best if you didn't invite me. And I felt really bad. I felt really bad. I mean, I didn't let her know. And I could tell, I could tell that she felt very bad to my friend. That was the eighth grade. You know, people are very sensitive at that age. The It's Our Story Project is a national effort to make disability history public and accessible. Visit us at www.itsourstory.org or on the It's Our Story Project YouTube channel.